Be it. That sounds kind of spooky. Via, <laughs> uh, on this Halloween morning, via telephone delegate Pat McGeehan. Pat, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. How's it going today? It's going pretty good. Were you uh, using a hammer or anything? <laughs> Pounding in supports? What were you doing? What am I doing? I'm drinking more caffeine, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, by all means, suck on some suck on some coffee then, buddy. I haven't had enough yet. We had a two-hour delay for uh, Catholic school I teach at, so it's a cold one out there. Yeah, it is, brother. You're up in, uh, near Wheeling this morning, right? Uh, well, in Chester, we mm -hmm. uh, we don't recognize Wheeling too often. <laughs> They're like an hour south of us. They don't recognize us, so it's just retribution. But, Ter uh, territorial wars, I get it. But, you know, from the perspective of the Eastern Panhandle, yeah, wheeling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That'd be like you saying to me, you guys are around Kaiser, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. Uh, hey, oh. you, you were telling me that you are now a teacher at a Catholic school in your area. What, uh, what, what brought about the change? Uh, well, I'm finishing a... a PhD at Duquesne, and so uh, while I'm doing that, I got offered a position to just teach civics, some philosophy, and history at the uh, local Catholic high school, and I know the um, administrator there, and so um, yeah, it was a welcome uh, change, and um, so I took him up on it, and you know, quality of my life has gone up by an order of magnitude, so uh, uh, something I enjoy, and um it's given me a little bit of experience while I finish a lot of things up. So I too went to Back. Duquesne University, sir. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. Really? Wow. Okay. All right. All but, right. Uh, yeah. 1981 to 1985, traipsing about the bluff there. Okay. Yeah. 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 I like the institution. It's nice. It's. Uh, I should be done there next year, but uh, yeah, I like it. What it's kind nice. of? Uh, hey, go ahead. What's that? I was. I was. But I was finishing them. Surprised they opened. They played uh, WVU in football. This yeah. year. I think they were actually competitive with them for the first quarter or two. We we led seven nothing at one point. That's pretty yeah, exciting. I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, Interesting. So, uh, Pat, what kind of reactions do you get from high school students uh, these days in the classroom? Uh, what what are your what are your thoughts on the the generation? Uh, it's pretty good. Um, you know, all of the um, seniors and juniors. Um, um, and they're they're, uh, they're they're pretty respectful. It's a, it's a different sort of take, though, at a traditional Catholic uh, high school, or these are these maybe your average public school. So you know, it might be a, a small sample mm -hmm. that uh, could be you know misleading. But you know, it's it's a good. Uh, I'm optimistic. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Why do you have a two-hour delay today? Uh, well, you know, we're very frugal and the, uh, the boiler would not, uh, uh, for, for heat would not turn on basically at our high school. There were some technical problems with, the uh, with the heating system. So I see. pretty cold this morning. So they decided to just delay things a couple hours. Gotcha. All right. Well, so, good, good luck on that. Yeah. Yes, Matt. I, yeah. I just want to know in teaching civics, are you finding that a lot of these high schoolers are interested in our government and how it functions and operates? Um, I, it depends. Now I've got the quarterback of the football team and it's the star tailback in, in my class. Sweet. Sometimes they're not as interested. But you know, I have a way to get through to those guys. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think there's you know, I think there's uh, it, it seems like, you know, it can be intriguing, but I mix a lot of different perspectives in with 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 things. And so I'll be teaching like uh, like ethics, too, and uh, a little bit of philosophy and some all elective courses. And those are where you get the lot of students are just interested in that class because they signed up for it. What is um, what is the name of your school, Pat? It's Madonna High School. Oh, okay, yeah. So what's a more attentive body, Pat, the students at Madonna <laughs> High School or the legislature when you rise to address them during the session? Uh, well, the students, because they have to pay attention. To <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I'll, uh, the younger kids, I'll, I'll, I'll make them do push-ups. or So that's the thing I can get away with at a private Catholic school. <laughs> you, you should try and make Height and Hornby bang out 10 if they're not paying attention when you're talking, man. <laughs> 
That's right. Just yeah. yell, hand shot, give me 10 yeah. quick ones. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you'd listen to me on that one. but <laughs> <laughs> Hey, let, I want to talk to you about uh, uh, some writing that you recently did in regards to the subject of euthanasia. And, and I can remember the whole Jack Kevorkian debate from about, what was that, 20, 25 years ago? I, it's hard to remember yeah. how fast time flies by on this. But yeah. uh, you recently wrote an editorial about this. And, and tell me what caused you to write this. Well, you know, we had the pro-life, the the uh, the anti-abortion law that I was sort of intimately involved with last year. And um, so that pulled me into sort of this existential um, world, I guess you could say. And uh, earlier this year, I had a strange sort of phone call from a constituent um, before Easter. Uh, It was like the Wednesday before Easter during Holy Week, actually. And normally, you know, when I get calls from constituents, 90 percent of them are something about potholes and and the road is terrible. And uh, but this this gentleman um, who I didn't know um, asked me to legalize euthanasia, uh, which was a really strange request. And, you know, so I politely declined um, just because of my own convictions. And but I I stayed on the line though because i thought well why is he asking me this and uh i asked him to share sort of his perspective and then he had then proceeded to tell me he had recently been given this devastating prognosis of colon cancer and he just wanted to end his life on his own terms um rather than go through the progression of the disease he um he he was given six months to live if he did not receive treatment. He was only 54, um, but if he got treatment, um, it would probably be a couple more years. But it, he could, you know, go into um, remission. Um, but you know, the chances were like 50-50 or something like that. But he just, you know, he just he just wanted to end his life, and he thought maybe. You know, I think he had a perspective that I could just wave a wand and legalize it, and he wouldn't have to travel to Oregon because he decided to travel to Oregon if he couldn't get it done around around here, um, where euthanasia is legal. Actually, Oregon recently expanded earlier this year their euthanasia law, which opened it up to non-residents, so any American can travel to Oregon and have this done. Um, and so that's what he was going to take advantage of. And he, and he, um, he told me he was planning on buying tickets to, uh, uh, to Portland, uh, on good Friday, actually a couple of days later. So I said, whoa, 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 wait, man, hold off on that. How about we meet up for dinner or something, you know? And so we did, he agreed. And, uh, we met for some dinner. I got some friends around him and, He's a good guy, real sweet guy, you know, conservative, actually. You know, he wasn't some sort of, like, you know, like left winger or anything. He, um, he, and he's actually turned out to be very wealthy. He owned a couple car dealerships across the river over in Ohio. Um, and, uh, but he told me, you know, at the end, it's none of this matters. And he was just disheartened. And I think I, we got him, I got him to sort of delay going to Oregon, but then, you know, he left and he ended up buying tickets and he headed out to Oregon on Easter Sunday. And, um, but he has, I guess the law out there makes you wait two weeks and there's a whole market now, um, that's been built up around this expanded euthanasia law. And you have all these hotels and Airbnbs that are dedicated. They call it, uh, medical aid and dying or death with dignity law or something. So they're devoted to this law from outside residents. And so basically it's just like, hey, if you want to come and stay at our Airbnb and wait the two weeks for the doctors to sign off, um, here you go. So they're sort of like profiting off this. But uh, so I spoke with him, you know, like practically every day while he was in Portland, um, while he's waiting for this final approval from the doctor. And um, I thought I hadn't talked out of it at one point, but the last time we spoke, he was 
it's early in the morning and he was minutes away from from ingesting this uh, lethal cocktail of drugs. Because now how it works is it's not like the Dr. Kevorkian style in the late 90s that was controversial where the doctors, like physicians assisted suicide, where the doctor just, you know, injects you with something. It's they just write you a script. You go to the local pharmacy and uh, and then they give you this uh, this lethal cocktail of drugs that you swallow and it just destroys your insides. And you lay down in one of these, you know, Airbnbs or hotels in Portland that are a, they're basically suicide hotels. And um, anyway, you know, I couldn't talk him out of it. It was a disturbing conversation, the last one we had, maybe 45 minutes long. And I got off the phone with him and, um, and I, I guess he did, he did it. And then uh, I, I got a, call from the, uh, some social worker the next day telling me, you know, you know, he did it. And it was almost kind of like she was bragging that they got him and I couldn't, I couldn't do anything about it or something. It was very, very strange. So that's sort of what that whole experience was very sort of chilling to me. Uh, it sort of further solidified my belief that, Hey, this is a, this is something that's really starting to take off, especially if you're following the news from Canada, which is which is maddening on what they're doing with euthanasia up there. So on that on that note, yeah. uh, Pat Jeff Haddock's just posted in the Netherlands they're allowing those with autism or intellectual disabilities to choose uh, euthanasia. Let me go to Matt Miller on this first. Matt, of course, worked here for a long time. Still does, uh, obviously, part time with us. Uh, was, as a co-host, does uh, still some camera work for Shepherd football games, uh, but also worked for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Matt, and I'm curious as to your opinion on euthanasia. It, it is a tough subject, uh, clearly, as I, I'm listening to what Pat is talking about and what this gentleman went through. But um, no, I, I am one. God is the, the author of life, and uh, it is not up to us to, to take that life. And so uh, it is certainly not something... That, that I would be in favor of. I, I even wrote down, uh, as Pat, you were talking, you know, the, the statistics that this gentleman was given and, and those statistics maybe seemed overwhelming at the time. And the, the first thing I wrote is emotional decisions at a tough time. Um, and, and so I, that's one of the areas that would concern me in a situation like this. You know, when you hear that news and you hear a certain statistic, it's easy to think, okay, I have no hope. And yet, um, you know, as a, a follower of Christ, I know that in, in God there's always hope. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that life will continue past a, a certain amount of time, but certainly within that time there, there's that hope that we can have in, in him. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I can't imagine what this man was going through and what you were going through, Pat, in, uh, in kind of walking with him down this journey. Yeah. Yeah, it was very odd. Um, I would never – before two years ago have thought I'd be in the position to be dealing with these types of issues. But, uh, uh, it's very, yeah, it is, it's very strange. You know, one thing I think we've forgotten in our society is that the law itself can often act as a sort of teacher, you know, it can be educational in society. And it's sort of, they start reflects our values and set standards of what's acceptable and what's not. Um, and it's not just, you know, sort of circumscribing, you know, individuals' rights or their sovereignty or something like that. So by, like, legalizing euthanasia, for instance, in this case, we're, we would be sending some sort of clear message that ending one's life is an appropriate response to suffering or hardship. And this in itself can create a sort of demand for the practice. You know, because individuals can come to view then euthanasia not only as some sort of right, but as, you know, a morally empowered, acceptable solution, a solution to their the problem of pain. And so when the law endorses euthanasia, you know, it can make the act seem like a normal and even desirable option and sort of leads more people to consider it when they may not have otherwise. And that's that's sort of the dangerous uh, slope, you know, has a potential to undermine the value we place on human life 
and the importance of providing support and care for the people that are suffering, you know. And so it has more to do with it allegedly just affects the end of life, but it really has a lot more um, uh, there's a lot more implications to uh, society than just that end of life uh, uh, self determination they want to assert. Well, you see, you see that if if what uh, was posted about the Netherlands is accurate, then you start going down that slippery slope of okay, well, we can do that with people who are terminal. What about with people who aren't in ideal situations intellectually or emotionally? Should we terminate? Yeah. You, you know, do we terminate that too? Uh, and and who's competent to make that decision, right? right? Are you in the yeah. right state of mind emotionally, or mentally, to make that decision? John Gilstrap, do you have some pushback here? I don't know if I have pushback. <clears throat> you know, I've, I've ran fire trucks and ambulances for 15 years, and I've seen a lot of suicides. I've run a lot of suicides, <clears throat> and I don't think anybody at that, you know, their mindsets that I just, I, I can't understand. You know, the, the, to get to a place that is that dark and... Uh, to make the decision to take one's own life. Um, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and be judgmental on on those individuals. However, I've seen the impact of suicides on on the family members, those who find them and those who, who are left bereft from the loss of, of their loved one. I don't understand why the government gets in, involved with this on either side, to be honest. I certainly can't wrap my head around a government sanctioned uh euthanasia hotel you know it just or that just makes no sense to me because suicide is ultimately and that's what we're talking about we can call it euthanasia euthanasia to me means that i'm making the decision to end someone's life where suicide is of the individual making the decision to end their own life and pat it seems to me that the the fellow you've been talking to was on the suicide part of that he he wanted to um, it was his decision to end his own life for for reasons that, that we can't really understand because we, we can't climb into his head. So the option, the other option of that, I'm just thinking out loud. This, I'm kind of uh, flat footed on on this issue. You know, the other side of it is when you have you know, a couple that's been married for 70 years and one spouse is just in agony and the the healthier spouse the one who's not in agony should they really just have to sit and watch their spouse scream and writhe and and go the hard way or is it really murder because that's the alternative right if we, if we outlaw this then it's murder is it really murder to help ease them to the other side i'm not taking a position here i, I just i that doesn't seem reasonable to me either because that's not an act of, it is an act of homicide. I guess it's the definition of homicide, but, but it's not an evil intent. So I think this is, this is a difficult position. I think it's uh, to take a strong position one way or the other. And I think we need to be careful about uh, making draconian judgments on laws in this area. Because it's slippery slope. You know, I have a DNR. I have a medical directive in, in the packet of stuff, you know, that, that, is part of my trust and will and all that. Um, that's on the same continuum, right? To not treat, to allow, to cut off the food supply or to not uh, do CPR when somebody, you know, when, when, when the heart stops. That's permissible. So, you know, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I'm stammering here because this is, a, I have a hard time making a judgment call. Well, let's just let Pat respond then, Pat. Uh, well, I mean, the examples you gave about what were you saying about uh, not having to resuscitate or something like that? Right. Is that what you were talking about? Right. DNRs. You know, that, you know, nat natural, natural death um, is, is something that's, that, that's different. Even if you're talking about, um, for instance, pulling the plug on someone, I mean, it's the, this the, the slang way of, saying withdrawing extraordinary medical care. So if someone's in a vegetative state, the family can withdraw, um, you know, uh, a med medical care, um, um, and the person passes away. Well, this is, that is not euthanasia, and that's not, because this is, it all has to do with intentionality. Uh, you know, your, your intentionality in that case is to, to uh, you want the person to live on their own. 
you know, and, uh, um, and so your intention is not to kill them, right? So that's what differentiates um, uh, medically assisted suicide uh, or euthanasia from some of the things that you're talking about, right? I mean, there's, it's, it's perfectly fine and, and, and morally acceptable, in my opinion, to, um, you know, have to finally make a decision that, hey, look, you know, Uncle LJ is just no longer uh, with us. He's just being kept alive mechanically by these extraordinary uh, machines. we got to make a decision now. And so withdrawing that type of extraordinary care is, uh, is, is not euthanasia because your, your intention is not to actually kill the person. Um, and so that's, that's, that's where we're getting into. And, and whether you want the government to get involved or not, it, it, it is involved regardless. Um, and we're not talking about just suicide here. I mean, if you want to demonstrate your own personal autonomy and your life, you know, you put a gun to your head, I mean, there's nothing the government's going to be able to do about that. That's not what we're talking about. We really are talking about, you know, what this does um, enshrines into law and into our values about life itself uh, at every stage um, because it corrupts the medical practice. I mean, doctors have a profound amount of authority in our, our, in our uh, society. And, uh, and so if it's legal and they're suggesting, as they are in Canada, hey, listen, uh, or you could go with this medical treatment, you know, like with a veteran that calls in that has post-traumatic stress disorder and says, hey, you know what, you could go with this, this or this, or this treatment, medical aid and dying. When they suggest that, they're basically doing so in morally empowered terms, as in, I'm an authority figure, I'm a doctor, and I'm saying this is okay. And that's why you find a lot of insurance companies now that would cover free, um, you know, free vasectomies, rather, regard, and they and they won't cover like you know having children because it's cheaper, right, to to cover you know a vasectomy because you don't have to pay for for kids, right. Or um, the same kind of concept would apply here where, you know, it would be um, much cheaper just to, you know, not treat the, say, addiction in Canada or the post-traumatic stress disorder from the veteran in Canada. You just recommend physician-assisted suicide, and it's over and done with. Pat, hey, we're, so, we're just about— we're just about out of time yeah. here. Uh, if you could, real quick, what is the current law in West Virginia regarding well, it's euthanasia? Not, it's not. It's not legal. You know, it's just not explicit. And so, you know, what I'm proposing is a, an amendment to the state constitution to make it very secure in the outlaw. So, but um, all I'll say is the people that uh, grow used to euthanizing their parents. Uh, are not a people prepared to are, are become a soft people. They're not prepared to, to sacrifice themselves, you know, for their father's homeland and, and the children raised under commercial advertisements that recommend suicide because this would become an industry. They're not children who are going to be raised ready to, to, to really stand as a patriotic and strong individuals anymore. Destroys basically the solidarity of the family. And it's with this sort of stemmed root it would ultimately help destroy the character of West Virginia. Pat, I appreciate your time this morning. As always, good conversation. No problem. Hey, God bless all you guys. Thanks for having me on.